my mother disappeared into one of the China's prison camps along with more than a million Uyghurs. Farkat hoped to get his mother Minowar out quickly. He held meetings with the U.S. government and started speaking out on social media. But then he started getting threats from Chinese officials. Since I started speaking out, I kept receiving uh, different threats from the Chinese government. The person also said that I have to shut up. If not, I'll lose my mom forever. Farkat and his mother are part of the Uyghur minority. She was held in what the United Nations calls an internment camp. Where did these mass detention camps come from? What issues do the Uyghurs face? And how is the world responding? Let's lay out the basics. Around 11 million Uyghurs live in China's Xinjiang Autonomous Region. They are Muslim, speak a Turkic language, and descend from Central Asia. By blood, I'm an Uzbek. But by identity, by culture, I'm an Uyghur. For centuries, the Uyghur community has lived in the region, often influenced by China. But the People's Republic of China annexed the province in 1949 after the Communist Party came into power. The Uyghurs are Chinese citizens, but are different from the Han Chinese majority in pretty much every other way. China recognized Xinjiang as an autonomous region. That should have given the Uyghurs some freedom to govern themselves. But that was never really the case. And soon the Communist Party began to relocate ethnic Han Chinese into Xinjiang. One is to see it as, as straightforward colonialism, trying to establish Han population in the region in order to better integrate it to the rest of China. From the Chinese Communist Party's point of view, this isn't a colonialist activity, it's rather one of development. Tensions between the Han and Uyghurs grew as the new arrivals prospered economically. The economic benefits from that development went to Han Chinese. In the 1990s, authorities began limiting the freedom of Uyghurs to practice Islam. They banned Muslims from fasting during the holy month of Ramadan and restricted access. China put the Uyghurs under intense surveillance and began operating the prison camps in 2017. That's the year Farkat's mother was taken. She left us a message on WeChat, the Chinese version of WhatsApp, where she said that she was going to school. The school is the code word that they use for the camps. Did she came back after 22 days, but she changed totally. The first thing she said is, son, I cannot talk to you guys anymore. Stop calling me. Since then, eight people from Farkat's family have been detained in these camps and all except his mother have cut off communication with Farkat. China initially denied the existence of these camps. This, uh, uh, what we call it, vocational education and training centers. They are there for the prevention of a terrorist. Critics maintain that in many cases, the camps are used for forced labor. And they also say that these camps exist to wipe out the Uyghur language and culture. These images are from state TV, and they show a more sanitized version of life inside. But detainees are forced to renounce their religious beliefs and embrace the ideology of the Communist Party. In March 2019, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met with Farkat. He praised his bravery in speaking out. Three months later, Farkat's mother was released to her home in Xinjiang, but stripped of her freedom and unable to reunite with her son. My mom was released on end of May 2019. Even though she was released, but she was given a phone by the Chinese police to talk to us. China has tried to suppress information on the camps. Journalists are not able to access them without heavy restrictions. In this video, a state news outlet shows Farkat's mom and uncle. <laughs> It suggests even Uyghurs living outside the camps, like Farkat's mother, remain unable to speak freely. Leaked government documents confirm the camps aren't really educational, with language like never allow escapes and increased discipline and punishment. The documents compare Islam to an infectious disease and say that freedom is only possible when the virus is eradicated. With so much evidence of human rights abuses out there, why has so little action been taken by the international community? 
Well, it's not really in the interest of most countries to criticize the second largest economy in the world. It's no longer just made in China toys, clothes, and food. China is building ports, railroads, and airports across Asia, Africa, and Europe. That may also explain why Muslim-majority countries like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia are silent. Many of them rely on China's investments and loans. Many states that are financially dependent on China have been willing to join、uh, Chinese efforts to say everything in Xinjiang is fine. And then there's China's war on terror rhetoric. The leaked documents showed President Xi Jinping saying his government was only doing what America had done. In the period after 9/11, 2001, the United States rolled out a new framework called the Global War on Terror. But it was very useful for authoritarian governments, really all around the world, and in particular in China, to latch on to that idea. But another reason countries are reluctant to speak up is that they want the tools the Chinese government is using against the Uyghurs. Surveillance technology in smartphones and security cameras allow the Chinese government to constantly monitor people's behavior and location without their consent. We have documented facial recognition, the use of biometric data, and then actually reverse-engineered an app that's used by police to aggregate enormous amounts of information about people's behavior. Since 2017, China's invested billions on security in Xinjiang. And more than 60 countries have already purchased Chinese surveillance tech, and it's now being put into use around the world. So, can anything be done to hold China accountable? In June 2019, 22 countries issued a joint statement to the UN Human Rights Council, calling on China to end its mass detention of Uyghurs. China responded by getting 37 countries to sign on to a statement praising its policy in Xinjiang. Meanwhile, the U.S. doesn't seem to have a clear policy, but Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has called China out on the issue. And in December 2019, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act by 407 votes to one, calling for sanctions against senior Chinese officials. But it still has to be approved by the Republican-controlled Senate before it's sent to President Trump. The White House hasn't said yet whether Trump will sign or veto the bill. Unsurprisingly, China was furious with the legislation. Lobbying efforts by Uyghurs like Faircat, who spoke out despite the risk to their families, helped persuade Congress. With one million Uyghur Muslims still imprisoned. The most high-profile opposition has recently come from an international football star and a girl on TikTok, rather than from governments. But Faircat and others believe more people need to keep the pressure up on China. A Chinese agent told me that I'm just one individual going against the second superpower in the world, and then compared to them, I'm just nothing. But I believe I'm strong because of the people around myself. Take China's increasing resistance to diplomatic and economic pressure. Add in its growing technological power and influence. Combine that with a lack of information on what's really going on in Xinjiang, and consequences for those who speak out. With all those things in mind, it's very difficult to see where the change Faircat needs will come from. It is lonely. It is scary. It's like a really hard process, but. Um, I'm still here.